Welcome and thank you for being here this morning. And as traditional, we'll begin the day with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate that very much. First of all, uh, a few thank yous. I, I believe we had a terrific breakfast. Uh, many thanks to Cindy. Please, a round of applause. I'm also told that there's going to be a wonderful lunch, but I was told that I was not allowed to know what it was. So your guess is as good as mine. Let's hope it is great. I'm sure it will be. A uh, couple of other thank yous. Stephanie for putting together a, a great uh, uh, Flex Week professional development uh, program for us, including, uh, yes. And uh, Milton for help, helping to set up uh, in the breakfast area that we had out there. And then again to recognize Sergio who actually puts together by hand each and every piece of the table setting. So thanks to both of them as well. And Melanie uh, in Diane's office put together PowerPoint today. Worked very well with her. Appreciate your good work on that as well. All right, uh, we're privileged this morning to have uh, some guests attending with us. Uh, first of all, we have uh, trustees Marsha Milchaker. We have trustee Barbara Jay. We have our chancellor, Kathleen Burke. We also have our vice chancellors, uh, Cindy Viscachill. Anne Marie Gable. And just a reminder for both of you to get an A, you have to sit in the front. And, you know. Also, uh, Robert Bermucci is with us uh, here today. And to help us open. Um, let me jump to the slide here. We have our chancellor coming up to welcome you this morning. Good morning. <clears throat> and so begins the second six months of my tenure with you. Um, just, uh, I hope you all had a, re a relaxing and restful break and are ready to take on the upcoming semester. Uh, I look forward to participating with you today in this very important topic. I was explaining that the last time I was in the classroom was 18 years ago and I didn't worry about the kinds of things that you all are facing today. So these are very important topics and I look forward to sharing this information with you. So good morning and welcome to the next semester. Thank you, Chancellor Burke. I appreciate that uh, very, very much. For our program today, uh, safety and security is a prime delegated responsibility of the college president. And I want you to know that I take that responsibility very, very seriously. We all know that recent incidences that have occurred nationally, statewide, in our city and on our campus have all increased the fear and concern regarding many different situations, including but not limited to potential violence, sexual assault, student behavior, hate, First Amendment, and mental health. I am proud to have worked with our faculty, classified professionals, administrators, and students to bring this program to you here today. 
The lead planning committee included professor and chair of the Academic Affairs Committee, Dan D. Roulet, professor and Academic Senate President, June McLaughlin, professor and faculty association president, Kurt Meyer, vice president of student services, Dr. Linda Fontanella, our police chief, John Meyer, and our director of marketing of creative services, Diane Oakes, and me. Thank you all for your excellent work in putting this program together. By attending today, you'll have the opportunity to meet and hear from the professionals that we routinely work with in regard to these concerning matters. We have the honor of hearing from a guest speaker that is also an expert on the First Amendment. We'll also have two panels that will be responding to questions that were solicited before the winter break. The first panel will cover our external partnerships and their roles, and the second panel will cover our internal district processes and policies. It is my sincere hope that the information provided today will encourage further dialogue and exploration into these important topics all within our schools and our departments and our various uh, committees. So at this time, I am privileged to ask our session moderator, professor and chair of the Academic Affairs Committee, Dan D. Relay, to the program, to the podium to get our program started. Dan? Good morning, colleagues. How are you? I found it uh, challenging to return to an 8 a.m. schedule this morning. I'm sure <laughs> that will normalize shortly. Um, I wanted to give just a little bit of context for what we'll be doing today. Uh, as President Rockmore mentioned, we will have a speaker followed by a panel, and the panel will be addressing uh, safety issues on, on a bit of a broader field across the county uh, across the nation in terms of what various schools are experiencing at this point. After that panel, we'll take a brief break and come back for the second panel, which will focus on specific concerns and strategies at Irvine Valley College for safety. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that our schedule continues after the president's session. Uh, the afternoon promises a, a, apparently a mystery lunch hosted by President Rockmore. Afternoon sessions on everything from DACA and immigration concerns to conflict resolution to building good curriculum to training for Canvas users and club advisors to understanding the student discipline process. And for those who may feel the contents of this morning's presentation a little overwhelming or anxiety producing, we'll have two sessions of CPR training as well. <laughs> but now, <clears throat> let me introduce this morning's speaker. Michelle Deutschman is a civil rights advocate and scholar with more than a decade of experience advancing free speech as an attorney and instructor, was named in April 2018 the first executive director of the University of California's National Center for, for Free Speech and Civic Engagement. Ms. Deutschman previously served as the Western States Council for the Anti-Defamation League, her portfolio there included free exercise and establishment clause questions that arise in school, housing, and employment contexts, and she as well conducted many trainings for law enforcement, educators, and attorneys on subjects including hate crime laws, religion in public schools, and cyberbullying, and the law. She also takes her expertise into the classroom where she teaches about on-campus free speech, cyberbullying in the law, religion in schools, responding to hate crimes again. She has led courses at state universities, school districts, county and state agencies, and numerous police and sheriff's offices. She is a Los Angeles native who made the long, arduous commute this morning from LA, and she earned a bachelor's degree in political science at the University of California, Berkeley, and a law degree at the University of Southern California. 
please join me in welcoming our speaker for this morning's President's Opening Session, Michelle Deutschman. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Okay, good morning. Thank you so much to Chancellor Burke and to President Rockmore and to Dan for that wonderful introduction. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, and we have kind of a robust agenda to cover, you know, everything about free speech on campus in 30 minutes. Um, so we'll see how uh, we're going to do. Um, I think the first thing to say is, of course, free speech issues on campus um, are a nationwide issue. Um, but I would, you know, I would hypothesize or suggest that in California, it's, it's especially important issue. I think we're kind of a bellwether for the country. We're pioneers. Um, I mean, and certainly we're where um, the free speech movement initially started. Of course, at UC Berkeley, go Bears! Um, so that's, of course, the picture, um, the iconic picture on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we have a picture also from Berkeley in that same. Um, near that same Sather Gate uh, from February 2017 when Milo Yiannopoulos visited um, the campus and, you know, in addition to protests and riots, you know, violence um, broke out. And I think that's one of the kind of stories that garnered nationwide um, interest um, in terms of, of of campus issues. So, I mean, one of the things I'm going to ask you to think about as we sort of talk today about current challenges on campuses is, you know, how different or how similar are things from the past, you know, and is that necessarily good? Is that necessarily um, not as good? So um, what I'd like to do today is to start with some challenges um, that are on campus. Each of these challenges could be the subject of its own 30 minutes. So we're going to go quickly um, and kind of touch on all of them and then sort of bring it together um, in terms of how these are impacting what's happening on campuses today and then have a discussion about what can we do going forward. So when we look at these, we see polarization, lack of civic knowledge, increased use of the heckler's veto, misunderstandings about hate speech, impact of anti-bullying programs, and increased efforts by white supremacists to recruit on college campuses. So let's take them one at a time and start with increased polarization. So you hear about this in the news, but there actually have been studies. There's a study that's done every year by the Higher Education Society at UCLA. They survey incoming freshmen. The most recent data is from 2016. And the most recent data shows that the last first year college that they, students that they surveyed were the most politically polarized in the 51 year history of the survey. So fewer students than ever before, so that's this time around 43% categorized their political views as middle of the road. So we have a majority of students identifying themselves as sort of on one end of the spectrum or the other, um, which is a change from what we have seen in the past, certainly when you look at this data. Um, Lack of First Amendment knowledge. Of course, you know, students come to college and we, you're not responsible for what happened before, but I think we could agree that we could be doing a better job um, in elementary schools and secondary schools to talk about civic knowledge. So the First Amendment Center conducts a study every year. Um, Last year it found that 40%, there was over 1,000 respondents all over the age of 18. 40% of the respondents could not name a single freedom guaranteed by the First Amendment. 36% could only name one, and then 9% thought the First Amendment guaranteed the right to bear arms. So what is the right to bear arms? Which amendment? Second. Second. Thank you. Okay. So how many people surveyed do you think were able to correctly name all five freedoms protected by the First Amendment? 1%? Okay. Someone said it. It was actually one. And of course, now I'm going to ask all of you, um, I wonder where, where the clicker is. I don't know if someone can bring me. I'd love to have the clicker so I can move. But in the meantime, um, okay, what are the five freedoms? Religion, speech, press, assembly. Thank you so much. And then what's the last one? That's the trickiest one. Yes, got, I might have a lawyer in the in the front row here, um, right? So these are some of the you know very basics before we get into the nuances. Okay, heckler's veto. The heckler's veto is sort of the legal term for when someone is so disruptive that protesters preclude the speaker from being heard. 
Okay? And I could show you a hundred slides of how this has occurred in the last couple of years. But um, this is, again, this was Middlebury College when Charles Murray came to speak there. Um, you see students initially turning their back, holding up signs. Um, couple other signs. Unfortunately, this actually devolved into violence, and the professor who brought Charles Murray to campus ended up with, I think, a broken nose in the hospital. So while violence is not typical, um, we're seeing things really escalating. Um, I also want to have an example. I don't like only to use examples of kind of more right-wing speakers being protested, because it does happen on both sides. This is actually post um, Charlottesville. Um, we had students at a University of William and Mary who booed the ACLU president when she came to speak, because they were very angry at the ACLU's decision to um, defend the Unite the Right rally folks who were there. So is the heckler's veto constitutional? No, no, it's not protected speech. The First Amendment doesn't give you the right to scream so loudly that the person who's speaking can't speak and the people that are trying to listen cannot be heard. And I think that's one of the fundamental misunderstandings about speech, which is that we have people who think that they're allowed to do whatever they want because it's their First Amendment rights to protest. So, of course, there are limited rights to protest, and those are you know, outlined, and certainly we can discuss those nuances. But when somebody comes in with the purpose of disrupting so that the talk can't go on, the talk the class, the seminar, or whatever it is, um, that's actually not protected, okay? Because it infringes on the rights of speakers and of the audience. I think I always say people love free speech when they're talking, and they don't always love it when they're listening. Um, but I think we have to remember that free speech doesn't just protect the speaker, it also protects the listener. And I think we have some um, confusion about how that's supposed to be used. And look, these are not easy questions because, you know, and, and I know we have some really esteemed members and we have the police chief here to talk about, okay, so when you do have someone come in and disrupt and they are using the heckler's veto and they're not listening, then what do you do, right? Because legally, while you might be allowed to drag them out, you know, then you also have a communications and a PR issue, which is like, how will it look? We all know the world of social media. How is it going to look to be taking students who appear like they're exercising their free speech rights, perhaps, and drag them out? So I think one of the things I love about these issues is I think they're very complicated. It's not enough just to say, is the speech protected or not? I think that's the easy question. When speech is not protected, when it's a threat or defamation or slander, I think that's easier than when the speech is really awful, but it's still protected. And then as a community, we have to ask, what do we do? How do we respond in the classroom, in the quad, in the dorm, other places? So another area of confusion, as you can see, is hate speech is free speech. Hate speech is not free speech. Okay. Is hate speech protected under American jurisprudence? I want to hear you loud. Yes. Okay? And it may seem basic, but this is a tremendous misunderstanding. And I've done a lot of talking on different campuses and with different community groups, and I can't tell you how often I'm asked to come in and please, I'll, they just want me to talk about the difference between free speech and hate speech. And I say, I, I can talk about those issues, but I can't talk about it like that because many people would argue that the reason we have free speech in the United States is actually to protect hate speech. So. Um, this is false. Hate speech is free speech, okay? As Voltaire said, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Another interesting trend that I've seen, there was a very interesting study, I don't mean to be too in the weeds, by Cato. And one of the things that they studied was they asked people the question about whether defending someone's right to say something hateful was as bad as actually saying it yourself. And a very significant portion of the respondents surveyed said yes, that they actually weren't able to distinguish between um, defending someone's right to say it and not agreeing with what they're saying. Now, for me, the only reason I can be a free speech absolutist in a lot of ways is because just of this, which is I can separate it and say, I don't agree with a, B, C, D, E, you know, all the letters of the alphabet people have to say, but they have the right to say it, right? And then I have the right to use my free speech rights to counter it with counter speech, and we're going to get to that. So um, I think there's a lot of discussion and thinking that's going on on college campuses about this idea of like feeling safe, words are not violence, some people feel like words do have the impact of violence, 
Um, it's not really about speech, it's about normalizing hate. I disagree with my opponents' positions and support their right to express them freely. The bottom line is that the way American jurisprudence is right now, hate speech is protected. Now there are large, there's large numbers of students on campuses that think that the First Amendment should not protect hate speech. And I think that's an interesting topic for another day. We're not going to take that on. There are people who are writing and philosophizing about what would it be like if we took on a system that was more like the European system where we punished hate speech. But that's not the system that we live in now. And I'm a pragmatist and I thought we've got to work with what we've got. Okay. I want to say a word about anti-bullying programs, and I say this as someone who came from an organization that did a lot of anti-bullying work, and as the parent of two young kids, I spend a lot of time talking to my children about words mattering, that they hurt, that when you hear someone saying something unkind or mean, right, you stand up and you say, you shouldn't say that, or that's mean, right? And so then, when you take these different things, you say, you take kids in these anti-bullying programs and you maybe don't give them the background and civics that they need, um, and they don't really understand that hate speech is protected by the First Amendment, and then you drop them off on a public school campus, I'm sort of surprised that everybody's surprised that they're having a hard time, because it's, it's sort of a confusing message, right? I mean, if the message is stop bullying and that words hurt, and we're supposed to respond, and we don't understand that the hurtful words are actually protected by our constitution and sort of the cornerstone of democracy, I think that is sort of a challenge to be thinking about how do we want to do a better job, not just in college, but I think it's, I think it's on a spectrum. We have to start at the beginning and kind of move through. And I think the last thing I want to mention is um, unprecedented targeting of college campuses by white supremacist groups. Um, the, the ADL, and this probably has been updated since the last time I got this statistic, um, they showed a 77% increase of white supremacists targeting college campuses with racist, anti-Semitic, Islamophobic flyers, stickers, banners, and posters. You can see 2016-17, there were 165 cases reported and that gen jumped to 292. Um, and I, I'm still continuing. Um, and I just, kind of to give you a sense, um, the people that are, you know, targeting college campuses with their sort of extreme messages, they're what I would call equal opportunity haters, right? I mean, you can see it's anti-Semitic, it's anti-LGBTQ, it's anti-Muslim, it's anti-immigrant. Um, so, you know, um, like I said, equal opportunity. So, a lot of challenges, and I think when you put them all together, polarization, lack of civic knowledge, increased use of the heckler's veto, um, targeting by white supremacist groups, right? We, ha we have this unique situation. And so, of course, then our question becomes, what can we do? Because I don't want to just come and tell you all the bad news, right? We have to talk about things that we can do. Um, and this, this is the hard part. So I think the first thing, and some of these things I think are going to seem very simplistic, but you'd be surprised by how often we see on college campuses they're not being done. Um, I think you have to acknowledge the detrimental impact of hateful speech. There is a cost. It's called free speech, but we all know that a cost is born, and we know that that cost is born largely by marginalized groups um, and people that are underrepresented. And so I think we need to like own that and sort of say, we know that this is a cost associated with it, and we are going to take pains to give people resources and the support that they need. And I saw that in your second panel later today, you're gonna to be talking a lot about these issues, especially as they, per, they pertain to mental health. So I think that's the first thing, is we need to stop just saying to students, well, free speech is the cornerstone of democracy, and yet we protect hate speech, and sort of this is why we live in America, right? That's not gonna cut it. We have to then go, I think, a level deeper to acknowledge that there are some costs born. The second piece, and of course I'm talking to a whole group of educators, is this continue idea of education. And I think part of the importance of the education is to put it in some historical context, right? I think for a lot of students on campus, this is what free speech means to them. This is what it looks like to them. And if I'm being honest, if I was on a college campus and this is what free speech quote unquote looked like, I'm not sure that I would be such a big free speech fan, right? And so it's important, I think, to bring them back to historical context, whether that's Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement, whether that's anti-war protests, which largely occurred um, on college campuses, um, whether it's going back to the you know in initial gay rights movements at Stonewall, um, moving forward to marriage equality and more, you know, the more recent decade, um, 
you know, protesting tuition hikes, students today kind of letting, reminding them that they're actually using their free speech rights all the time. Um, with DACA, Dreamers, you know, helping them in that most vulnerable moment, um, Me Too movement. I mean, these are things that are national issues, but that I think we've really seen highlighted on college campuses. And I think it's important for them to understand that all of these movements didn't just happen. Part of it was because people had that speech. And the speech that was being used throughout history, the people in positions of power, they thought that speech was really dangerous and ugly. The same way that people might think certain speech today is dangerous and ugly, but that we have to remember that once we go down the slippery slope of trying to regulate one person's speech, you have to know that it may be your speech that's next. This is one of my favorite quotes by Hugo Black. He was a Supreme Court justice from the 30s to the 70s. It um, says, the framers of the Constitution knew that free speech is the friend of change and revolution, but they also knew that it is always the deadliest enemy of tyranny. I think that gives good perspective. Okay, I also think it's important to remember, and we could again, if you gave me more time, I, we could do a whole dissertation on um, attempts to censor speech. Um, we have to remember that, again, historically, it shows us that even when we try to censor hate speech, um, it ultimately results in undermining diversity, inclusion, and equity. And I'm just gonna, I just picked one example. Um, so I don't know if people know, but um, Many colleges and universities used to have um, hate speech codes that would, you know, penalize someone for using speech that was like demeaning or offensive. Of course, the question was, who defines what's demeaning or offensive? I might think something's really disgusting and the person next to me might think it's actually hysterical, right? So the speech codes have largely, I mean, have all been struck down by courts. But during the time that Michigan's speech code was on the books, only for one year, more than 20 black students were charged with racist speech by white students. But there wasn't a single instance of a white student being punished for racist speech, even though that was what had prompted the drafting of the Michigan speech code in the first place. So I'm not saying that this happened in every case, but as you look through examples, and you've seen this also in Europe with some of the um, hate speech penalization that's happened, that the people that the laws were actually trying to protect ultimately became the victims of them. Again, that is one of the very challenging parts of trying to regulate speech. Um, because if, I bet if I asked you each to take out a piece of paper and write down your definition of what you think hate speech is, something tells me that we would have a lot of different definitions. And so that's, again, one of the reasons that I think it's virtually impossible to regulate hate speech. And we're not talking about the internet today because that's you know, outside the realm of the First Amendment and a topic for another time, but you see the private sector struggling day in and day out um, about how to regulate speech because they're allowed to pull down speech and how do, who decides and how do you decide what speech um, should be pulled down. Okay, what else can we do? Empower campus stakeholders to speak out in the face of ugly words. Again, this is something very basic, but I think you cannot underestimate the value of using your own voice. And the example I'm gonna give is like of a college president, but I wanna make it clear that everybody has a voice, you know, in the classroom, whether you're a resident advisor, whether you're a faculty member, whether you're in student affairs or student services, you have an opportunity to use your voice. Not to punish someone for saying something offensive or ugly, but to have an opportunity to have a learning moment, to, to set parameters in the classroom and say, you know what, I respect your point of view, but I'm I'm gonna insist that you share your perspective in a way that's respectful, that uses civil discourse. So I'm gonna use this example. It's a real example from Cleveland State. Um, I worked for, at the Anti-Defamation League for 14 years, and I will tell you, I saw a lot of horrible, hateful flyers. This was one of the most hateful flyers I've ever seen. And even though I'm like so dedicated to free speech, I had a moment where I was like, what can I do to make this flyer, not a protected flyer because it's so awful. Um, it basically says, and pardon me for reading this word, follow your fellow faggots, and it basically has statistics about trans people and um, committing suicide, um, LGBT-related suicides, and it seems to be encouraging people um, who are affiliated with or LGBTQ to take their own life. Okay, so is it protected speech? Yes, okay. Does anybody know what you would have to do to change this flyer so that it would not be protected? Someone can raise their hand or shout it out. Right, okay, so that's a good term, but how? How would we make it so that it's, it's maybe more of a threat? A call to kill them. 
Yes, but I think it would even need to be more specific than that, and of course the chief can jump up and correct me if I'm wrong. I think you would need to have some specific targets. Maybe it's the LGBT club on campus. If you had a list of students or the names of particular students, that's how it's going to rise to the level of being unprotected speech. But as it's written here, if this is put up on the right bulletin board and following all the right rules that you have about placement of stickers and posters, then from a constitutional perspective, this is gonna be permitted, okay? So this happened, and here's the statement that um, the president of Cleveland State made. He talked about maintaining a welcoming environment, fully committed to campus community that respects all individuals, committed to upholding the First Amendment, protecting free speech to ensure that voices may be heard and promote civil discourse. Okay. What do you think of this statement? Okay. So someone said it doesn't address it, okay? So first of all, I'm not trying to pick on this individual, right? So the good news is a statement was made, right? Which is the start, which is somebody said what's happened on our campus is worthy of a response. Okay, this particular statement did not go over well. Probably the students gave him like an F. Um, and you'll see the response to that statement is in some of this response by the student body. It says, LGBTQ people are full human beings, deserving of our support, love, respect. This one up here says, Berkman cares more about his paycheck than his marginalized students. We deserve to feel safe on campus. Okay, so the next day, a new letter says, I wanted to acknowledge that yesterday I failed to express my personal outrage over a recent incident involving an anti-LGBTQ poster that was recently posted on campus. So two things, one, personal outrage, right? Even though that poster might have been allowed on campus, he can still say from his personal perspective, he found it to be outrageous. The second thing I think is key is the naming of the specific kind of hate. It's not enough just to say, we welcome everybody. In this case, it was LGBTQ people on campus that were, this message was being sent to, and so he needs to name that hate. Talks about the legal framework. Again, commits again to promoting a safe and inclusive environment, and then invites members of the, of, he says his staff, and he will be in the main classroom auditorium to discuss concerns. So creating a place to then go and talk about these issues on campus, okay? Now, again, is it always easy to craft the right message? No. Is it hard to decide when to craft a message? Yes. You can't send a message every time there's a hateful flyer on campus because then the message becomes diluted. What does it mean? At the same time, you have to be careful because if you respond to an anti-LGBTQ flyer and you don't respond to an anti-Muslim flyer, then someone might say that you're showing favoritism between groups. So I don't want to in any way give you the sense that I think this is easy. I'm just saying I think it's a tool in the toolbox that can and should be used. I think when you respond to constitutionally protected instances of hate or bias, you use direct, clear, and timely statements. You name the hate and campus leaders at all levels just need to show leadership and moral clarity. When you speak out, it prevents conflict from deepening, it stops campus polarization, and it limits the open invitation for public scrutiny, whether that's by the press, by alumni, by others. I wanna reiterate, everyone has a voice on campus, but I think it's also key to remind people that the First Amendment also protects your right to remain silent. And I think that's also really key to think about. So when you have someone, whoever it is, you know, I, get, I keep using Milo. Milo comes to campus, right? Of course, students have the right to stand outside where he's speaking and protest him, but they also have the right, and perhaps I would suggest it might be a better idea, to go somewhere else and do some kind of alternate program in a different place at the same time. So we're not giving the provocateur the attention that they want, okay? It's a choice. It's a choice, and it's, it's been used, I think, very um, successfully on a number of campuses where you have a diversity forum or you have a, um, someone was like playing music and like there was food, like I can't think of the right word, but you know, when I have alternate programming, okay. Um, I want to spend a minute talking about um, policies. So I know you're going to spend a lot of time talking about policies and I don't have time to do like a whole free speech 101, but I do want to spend a minute talking about time, place, and manner policies. So, um, you know, once you're in a public school, right, and the First Amendment applies, the short version of the rule is, once you open up your forum to Speaker A, you're going to have to let Speaker B, C, D, E, F, G come in. That's the way that it works, okay? 
But one of the constitutional ways you can restrict speech is by using time, place, and manner restrictions. So we'll do a really basic one. Amplified sound is permitted in designated campus outdoor locations from noon to one, Monday through Friday. What's the time? Oh, sorry, what's the place? Let's start with that. Designated campus locations, right? Uh, oops, hold on. Oh, it's skipping my two slides. Okay, well, designated campus locations is, is place, the time obviously noon to one, and the manner is amplified sound. So can you still talk from noon to one in designated campus outdoor locations? Yeah, you just can't use amplified sound, okay? Does this talk about what you're allowed to say? No, it only talks about the time, the place, and the manner of your speech. Okay? So time, place, and manner restrictions are constitutional as long as they serve an important purpose. So I would say, of course, that's an important purpose. They only want amplified sound during sort of lunch hour. They don't want it to interfere with study groups or classes. That it applies to everyone. And then the key is that it doesn't discriminate according to subject matter or viewpoint. So subject matter would be, you could not have a rule that says, you can use amplified sound, except you cannot discuss immigration. That would be subject matter. And then viewpoint would be, you can use amplified sound, but you can't speak for immigration reform or against immigration reform, right? So you can only regulate the time, the place, and the manner in these situations. And the reason that I raise this is because when we think back to Charlottesville, which has been used as a, you know, a case study in a lot of ways, and again, I feel like it's easy to do is it Monday, Monday morning quarterbacking? Is, is that right? Okay, I don't watch football, so I shouldn't use that analogy, but one of the things that they basically sort of determined after everything that happened at UVA and Charlottesville um, was the Unite the Right group arrived without warning or without a permit, okay? A permit can be another kind of time, place, and manner restriction as long as you have the, you know, consistent rules that you apply. So. And they, hadn't, they had no formal permitting process, and they didn't have any time, place, and manner policies for use of common spaces on university grounds. So do you remember Friday night, they went marching with the tiki torches like through campus? So if there had been time, manner, and place restrictions, it's possible, they, they still could have marched, but they might have been restricted to particular areas on campus. And if there had been a permitting process, then perhaps the administration, law enforcement, would have been aware that they were coming and they could make the appropriate preparations. So I think that's why you're seeing a lot of campuses across the country going in back and reviewing their codes of conduct, their policies, their major event policies, their disruption policies, because the truth is the devil's in the details. Um, and it's not enough just to have policies. They have to be consistent, and then you have to enforce them consistently. Because if you let group A march and you don't say anything about their tiki torches and you let group B march and you don't say anything about their tiki torches, but then group C comes and you're like, oh wait, I forgot, we're not supposed to use fire on campus, then you've got a problem. Probably a constitutional problem because someone's going to argue that you are discriminating against the viewpoint of group C because you're telling them no, they can't use you know, their torches or their signs. Okay, I think I have like less than three minutes, so a few best practices you may want to consider. Uh, communications, again, hard to communicate in a way that shows empathy, transparency, inclusivity, understanding. Um, don't forget about social media. I don't know if people will remember the case of Taylor Dempson. She is, was the student body president at American University, first African-American student body president. The day after her election, there were bananas and other things hanging on campus, basically making really horrible remarks about her about her race, and kids got on social media, and basically they started this thing called the Real AU, and it basically was like, this is not our campus, our cam our, the Real AU is, you know, and I think people put up photos of diversity and inclusiveness. Task forces and committees, I know that's a lot of what you're going to be talking about today. I think it's good to have committees that are sort of interdisciplinary, we don't want to stay siloed. Um, Ally behavior trainings, campaigns, dialogues like today, um, obviously including law enforcement, which, which you're doing. I can't tell you how many places you, I've gone and said, oh, so you know, when, you, when you deal with these situations, you know, who's the liaison to law enforcement? And everyone's like, well, you know. It's like, no, no, not you know. It's like this is, these, are, these are the ways that we're going to bring in not just campus law enforcement, but perhaps local law enforcement too. And then inclusive policies and practices. 
Free speech and exchange of ideas, obviously, is one of the most important parts of any university experience, right? We want to in encourage robust inquiry and curiosity and freedom to share ideas. And then we also, on the other side, want education and campus safety. Um, and it's a really difficult balancing act. And um, I don't have um, the answers. I think the answers can only be found through collaborative work um, together as we kind of move forward in our changing times. And um, the Free Speech Center is actually based at UC Irvine, so I'm right down the street. So to the extent that this could be an ongoing uh, conversation, um, I, I, I hope that will be the case. Um, I wish I'd had time to take questions. You can find me during the break. Um, and I want to thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much to Michelle Deutschman. That was wonderful. Um, I did speak with Michelle, who was comparing the commute from Los Angeles, which can be anywhere apparently from about an hour to three and a half hours, to uh, the commute from UC Irvine to IBC. And we hope that we will have opportunities, uh, if you are so willing, to come back and help us walk through more of this. It's an amazingly complicated issue. Uh, I'd like to invite our first panel up. Uh, to the podium, and as they're making their way up, I want to say just a couple of things about the panels today. Uh, our first panel is meant to represent a broader look at uh, trends, both nationally and in Orange County, in terms of what's happening on college campuses and, and how folks can deal with some of these issues. Uh, we have asked for and received quite a number of questions from faculty and classified staff and management at IVC. And we have uh, assigned questions to each of our panelists this morning. Uh, this is a way of kind of using our time wisely and also, I think, uh, inviting audience involvement. However, the discussion can't end here. And our Academic Senate will be working uh, this semester to have a couple of follow-up forums. Uh, Situations like this usually help you to understand the questions that maybe you should have asked. And if you're like me, those questions usually occur to you uh, two or three days after you get out of the room. So the notion of coming back and having in a more intimate discussion uh, session uh, opportunities to discuss some of these issues I think will be very helpful for us. I'd like to introduce our panel. Oh, very good. Um, and I'm going to uh, work through uh, our folks here, and it, as I introduce you, if you could uh, please uh, acknowledge, raise your hand so we know who you are. Uh, first of all, uh, Sergeant uh, Darren Bram from the Orange County Sheriff's Department. Uh, secondly, of course, Michelle Deutschman. Uh, third, uh, Officer Rick Gramer from the Irvine Police Department, uh, who specializes in intruder response training. Uh, Mr. Don Han from the Orange County Human Resources Council, or Relations Council, pardon me. Uh, Chief Mike Hamill from the Irvine Police Department. Lieutenant Pat Hurtado from the Irvine Police Department. Uh, also, our own Chief John Meyer of Campus Police at Irvine Valley College. And finally, Special Agent Anna Miller, uh, representing the FBI. Oh, it always concerns me when the FBI doesn't show up. Hmm. <laughs> but apparently, professor, uh, <laughs> professor, Special Agent Miller will not be joining us this morning. Uh, so we're going to go through a number of questions. Uh, and I'll, uh, again, call out the particular folks. They've had time to think through the questions and give a response. Uh, so first, we're going to start with our speaker, uh, Michelle Deutschman. And looking at this question now, Michelle, uh, especially after your presentation, I realize I think it could be uh, asked a little bit differently, but this is how things go. Uh, so uh, one of the questions we received uh, from faculty and staff was this. How do we differentiate between hate speech, hate incidents, and hate crimes? And how do we know when an individual in the classroom has kind of crossed over from a free speech situation into something that resembles more hate speech. Okay. 
Can you hear me? Yes? Okay. It's me again, but don't worry, I'm only going to answer one question. Um, so I think this piggybacks really nicely on what we were talking about, and I'm guessing that many of you sort of know part of the answer. I want to start with hate crimes first, though, um, because people oftentimes, I think, confuse hate speech and hate crimes. You'll see someone holding a poster, a flyer, and saying, this was on my lawn, this is a hate crime, and I don't know, right, okay, it's not a hate crime. Um, the most important word in, of the two words, hate and crime, is the word crime. Hey, when you have a hate crime, you need to have criminal activity, assault, battery, arson, murder, okay? So what we have is we have an underlying crime that occurs, and then you have, in California, there are what are called penalty enhancements. So once you prove the underlying crime, let's say it's an assault or battery, then you have to then prove the elements of the actual hate crime. And to show that something's a hate crime, you have to show that it was motivated because of certain characteristics. And in California, we have one of the broadest number of characteristics, and that's race, religion, ethnicity, um, um, uh, gender identity, sexual orientation. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting a couple. Um, but broad categories, okay? And the key with the hate crime, though, is you need to have a nexus. You need to have a connection between the crime and the target. So I'm going to give you a really basic example, um, which is, let's say one night, there's a synagogue in my neighborhood and it has a nice white wall on the side, and I get up and I, I decide to tag, Michelle loves Jeremy. Is that a crime? Yeah, what's the crime? Vandalism, right? Okay. So let's say the next night I'm feeling a little more emboldened and I go back to the wall. It's, it's been erased, and I write, Jewish pigs must die. What's the crime? Same crime, right? Going to cost the same amount of money to sandblast that off. Is the impact the same? No, the impact is different, right? Because in the second case, I've selected a Jewish place of worship, and I've written something very targeted and very hateful about Jewish people, and you could apply this to any group of people, okay? And that's going to be what makes it a hate crime. You have the actual crime, the vandalism, and then you see that you have a target. In this case, it's the targeted because of religion, and you have a nexus between the two. Hate crimes are very hard to prove, okay? And so that's the first piece. So the second piece is, you know, hate speech, right? So I don't need to go through that because now you know that the difference between hate speech and hate crimes is that one is allowed, hate speech is allowed, right? And I think the question about when do you know in a classroom that something goes from hate, you know, from free speech to hate speech, I don't think that's the right way to ask the question. I think the question is when hate speech, which is protected, comes up in your classroom, how do you respond? And um, I, I had already made some suggestions. I won't repeat myself. Um, and then I think that, because um, I think, I guess I want to end by just saying, I think that these issues are, there's two levels always of looking at them. One is the legal, and then there's also ped pedagogical, right? And so legally, can you kick someone out of a classroom for saying something like, you know, you know gays are sinful? No. But can you respond and talk about why that belief might be, you know, not, you know, credible or something like that, of course. And then hate incidents, I mean, I should defer to the chief, but hate incidents, I think, can be both. Some people consider hate, hate incidents are often a word that's described for like posters and other protected speech. So it's not a hate crime, but we still want to tag it. We still want to report it as hate incidents because oftentimes people that commit hate incidents are those that commit hate crimes later. And so I would argue it's important to keep track of them. Um, and sometimes hate incidents can also be criminal in that if someone writes, um, kill Muslims on a park bench, that's criminal, but it's not targeted if it's just on a random park bench as opposed to if you put it on a, you know, Muslim school. So hate incidents can be both used to describe non-criminal and criminal activities. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I've apparently also neglected to introduce one more panelist. Uh, we also have uh, Pilar Marin, who is a uh, South Orange County Community College District Legal Counsel with us as well. At least that is the note that I have been passed. Uh, second question uh, for Mr. Don Han. Uh, what are some best practices to create a campus culture of inclusivity that supports diversity and decries intolerance? Thank you. Okay. So. First and foremost, I wanted to thank Michelle for um, 
such an educational um, presentation on hate speech and free speech. And some of my um, answer probably can be rep repetitive of what Michelle just su suggested um, on how to create safe and inclusive campus. So I want to give a little bit of my background. Um, for almost uh, two decades, I've been working with the Orange County Human Relations uh, Council. Sorry, can you hear me now? Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. So um, just a little bit about, about my background. Um, I've been with OC Human Relations for almost 20 years now, and in the last um, 13 years, I have the privilege to be working through our school program throughout Orange, um, through different school and school district throughout Orange County in implementing a human relations um, program on school campuses. And the mission for that program is to help school create a safe and inclusive campus uh, to support diversity. So, and part of that work is also helping school responding to hate uh, incident and hate crime on the campuses and working alongside with them and how to uh, respond to those uh, incidences that happen. So I also um, have the privilege to be the responder to hate crimes um, with law enforcement uh, in Orange County. So if I get a phone call from the sheriff department or police department say we're responding to a hate crime, my job is actually to reach out to the victim and provide services and support to them. So to answer that question, to, in order to support something, you have to understand what it is, um, including diversity and including um, the inclusion of people from different backgrounds. So if you understand the makeup of your own community on your own campus, and creating the term diversity implies that respect for all people and understanding of who they are and their needs. So that would be one of the first steps. The second one probably be creating um, a space where they could get access to resources. Uh, for example, if marginalized community member wanted to come and, and, and ask you for your support, they have to know how to get there. And then they have, they have to know how, what is available for them. So oftentimes students or even faculty do not know what are the resources on their campus so that they can access that uh, um, appropriate uh, resources to help their student or themselves. So maybe creating something like that is visible or even through communication channel that they understand what's available. Create a program that support diversity is important. Not just responding, but also being proactive of how our campus to support diversity that we have. Go as far as reaching out to the community that outside of your own campus. Reaching out to, like for example, UCI or folks here on this panel to, to support of what you are trying to implement on your campus. And definitely recruit students, faculty, board of trustee, donor that reflects your diversity. It sends a message that we are inclusiveness of what we believe in. Sometimes the administration has to take a little, um, what you call, a different route to respond to hate and, and, and um, hate speech or hate incident or hate crime that happened on campus, even though it might um, put the administration at a different, just like the, um, what Michelle have shown, the first statement from that president maybe cover the broader scope of what happened on that campus. I don't, I don't remember what, what college that was. But the second statement actually identify what the president uh, are not accepting in terms of allowing hate uh, and bigotry to happen on campus. So last but not least, to empower the people on your community or in your community to stand up and speak out and send a message that hate and discrimination are not tolerated or accepted on our campus. Thank you. You'll notice that <clears throat> many of the answers this morning uh, require follow-up. <laughs> and part of our goal here is to begin the conversation. Uh, sometimes, uh, especially academics like myself, we believe that if we've talked about something long enough, we've pretty much solved the problem. Uh, 
we, we can't allow that attitude to continue. So we will be following up and we thank the panelists for their suggestions on things that we can consider. Uh, a third question having to do with uh, threat assessment, and this is for uh, Irvine Police Chief uh, Mike Hamill. Uh, if you would uh, please describe the steps in a typical threat assessment process. Thank you. I think the first thing that's important to uh, understand is, is exactly uh, what the overarching purpose of a threat assessment is, and that is to interrupt uh, people who may be on a pathway to commit some kind of uh, violent act. And typically, a law enforcement threat assessment uh, consists of three prongs. Those prongs are identify, assess, and manage. And I'll speak briefly about each of those prongs. First, with regard to identify, uh, problems uh, or individuals who may pose a threat come to us in, in a variety of different ways. It could, it, the information could come to us from an educator like yourself, maybe it's a school resource officer, we could receive a, a tip from the public, perhaps that tip is anonymous or it is someone who comes forward. It could be um, information from investigations being worked by other officers in the field or detectives. Sometimes human resource managers come to us with information that they're concerned about. Or once in a while, we also hear from mental health professionals when information they receive um, uh, goes beyond what their, their confidentiality um, um, requirements are and, and they, they are concerned for the safety of somebody and come forward. So once we receive this information, the next phase is um, assess. And one of the key points here is two, two key points. One is collaboration, that as we uh, now work uh, through this information and try to um, figure out exactly what's going on beneath the surface, it's important that we work with other stakeholders, other law enforcement agencies, other um, allied agencies, schools, to develop a really good understanding of what's going on. And the other part that I'll mention, and I reference uh, back what Michelle talked about, about um, free speech and constitutional rights, and for, for public safety, for law enforcement, public safety is a priority, but we have to be sure as we work leads, as we interview people, as we make these assessments, that we're also doing it um, with the constitutional rights of everyone involved in mind. So we'll use a variety of different uh, open uh, sources of information. Sometimes it's social media sites, information that can be found on the internet. Uh, also, we will use closed law enforcement, only law enforcement sites. We will interview people. Uh, we'll uh, uh, try to identify exactly what's going on, try to make some assessments about the information that we received. Uh, this helps us identify specific warning behaviors and determine if the subject is, in fact, on a pathway towards targeted violence. And if that violence may be imminent. And some of these things that, that we'll assess, we'll look at, um, you know, did this person, did they recently lose their job? Have they recently been rejected? Did, did a spouse leave them? Uh, is there any information about psychosis? Are they being charged with a crime? Are they being sued in court? Things like that. We'll also look at whether or not this person in the past has ever uh, undergone treatment, how receptive they are to treatment, what their family or other social support mechanisms are. And after we work through all this information, then we'll classify the threat as either low, medium, high, or imminent. And once we've done that, the last phase is then to manage the threat. And there's a many different mitigation strategies that can be employed based on this threat uh, management um, assessment. Sometimes it's simply watch and wait and monitor the situation. And other times, uh, we may advise that the best process would be to try to obtain some kind of civil or criminal protection order. Sometimes we'll uncover uh, a crime that has actually been committed and so we'll make an arrest and then there will be court proceedings. Uh, other times we may uh, try to involve mental health, maybe uh, mental health resources are in order, or sometimes we may try to work with the individual or human resources. Uh, with regard to anger management resources being provided. So that's in a nutshell how law enforcement in general conducts um, uh, threat assessment. Thank you. One of the things that uh, Chief Hamill mentioned in his response is the uh, obligation to protect the constitutional rights of everyone involved in a threat situation. Uh, so a question for Chief Meyer. Uh, once a threat to safety is actually determined. What are the obligations of colleges in particular 
to notify employees. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, so under the Cleary Act, uh, which is um, the act that uh, it requires us a, 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 as a higher education institution to uh, notify all the entire campus community, whether it's students, staff, employees, uh, administrators of, of uh, uh, emergency situations. Uh, there are three ty basic types. There's timely warnings, uh, emergency notifications, and public safety advisories. And I'll go through each of those in, in a little more detail. Now, timely warnings, uh, the legal standard for that is a potential ongoing serious threat, but not necessarily an immediate threat. Uh, it would be, for example, a situation where we had a recent robbery reported on campus or a sexual assault or maybe a series of burglaries to vehicles where we wanted to uh, arm the, the entire campus community with the information and also include uh, crime prevention tips on how not to be a victim and just to keep them informed. We would do this through our uh, mass outreach uh, regroup notification uh, system that we have employed through email and text of our uh, uh, of all everyone that's involved in that program, uh, students and staff. Uh, we would not necessarily follow up with that if 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 uh, we received a report of a crime, we would put that out. Uh, if nothing uh, followed through and, and there was no other concerns, we, you may not hear anything more about that. Uh, but the next level would be an emergency notification, and that's a little bit more serious, a little more imminent, and the legal standard for that is an immediate threat to health and, and or safety. Uh, and the circumstances surrounding this type of uh, notification would be a clearly reportable crime. Uh, let me backtrack a little. The clearly crimes, if you're not aware, are typically the more serious crimes, uh, rape, robbery, murder, sex crimes, burglary, theft of vehicle, a uh, felonious assault, not just a simple assault and battery, but a felonious assault where someone's uh, significantly injured using a weapon or other means, uh, drug, liquor, and weapon violations on campus. Those are all clearly reportable crimes. Uh, if we've had a cl clearly reportable crime <clears throat> that's either happening now or uh, about to happen, or let's say we had a, uh, a, a different situation where maybe a gas leak or a chemical spill that was gonna, is going to affect the safety and but not a criminal nature, uh, that would prompt an emergency notification, and that would go out to either the entire campus community uh, or a specific area of the campus being affected. Uh, so it's not required to go out to the whole campus community, but in certain situations it may just be needed in a certain area. But those would typically go out through our regroup notification system through, uh, through all users, again, on email and text. They also may be posted uh, on our campus police webpage uh, as appropriate. Uh, now, on that one, follow-up is typically required. We would need to uh, let, some, let you, know, you know, okay, the building is secure now, or the leak has been stopped, or we've apprehended the individual that we were looking for, uh, or the, the original reports are erroneous and there is no actual threat, but we would typically give a follow-up uh, information on that so that uh, the situation could be somewhat normalized in your mind and we would be able to resolve it that way. Uh, lastly, we have public safety advisories, and these are probably our most common types of uh, notifications that would go out. Uh, there is no real legal standard for this. This is uh, typically at the discretion of the institution. Uh, some of the circumstances uh, involving uh, public safety advisories would be safety or security uh, of a situation that doesn't meet the threshold for a timely warning or emergency notification. Uh, for example, a series of bike thefts on campus or other uh, or identity theft situation going on from the student store or something that uh, where there's a series of crimes, but they were not clearly reportable crimes. They were more mi minor crimes in nature. Um, and then lastly, I want to touch on that we do have situations, as you're all aware, where we have students that present us with certain challenges in, in class and di disciplinary issues. And those are situations where we make every attempt to notify uh, each one of you who may have one of the, those students in your class just to keep you aware of what the ongoing situation is with them and to follow up as appropriate in those situations. Thank you. Uh, one of the points that <clears throat> Ms. Deutschman brought up this morning was uh, the issue of living in a polarized society where uh, issues of safety have, have become more and more common for every college campus to look at. So a question for uh, uh, Officer uh, Grammer and Lieutenant Hurtado. Uh, what sorts of safety procedures 
actually are best practices at college campuses? And conversely, uh, what procedures that have been touted in the past have actually proven to be ineffective? Thank you. I think the bottom line is we need to uh, maintain and grow our sense of campus safety. We need to develop that mindset of campus safety. And many of us are doing already. One of the things that we teach when we're talking about uh, active shooters, for example, or violent intruders, we talk about that mindset. What if this happens? And it's a game that you can play every day. What if this happens? And in fact, many of you are already doing it. You may have thought, what if the freeway shuts down on my way to work? Which direction am I going to go? And you already know it. You get up in the morning, you listen to the radio. If I freeway shut down, I know which direction I'm going to go. Many of you have thought, what if my child gets sick at school while I'm at work? Who's going to take care of them? Who's going to watch them? You have a plan in place. You know exactly what's going to happen because you've played that what-if game. We truly need to bring that sense of what-if now into our job and into campus safety. What if we're in the campus, in my classroom, and a student jumps up and starts screaming, hateful speech? What am I going to do? I'll tell you what, I've been in um, thousands of police pursuits through my career as a police officer, all of which have been in my head. Huh. Well, I'm driving around in my patrol car on my way home from work. I'm pursuing the person in front of me. What if the person turns left? What am I going to do? What if the person jumps out of the car? What am I going to do? What if two people jump out of the car? What am I going to do? And I'll tell you what, when that time happens and I'm in that pursuit and that person jumps out of the car, I know exactly what I'm going to do because I've played it in my mind thousands of times. Now, we can do those same things when we're inside of our classroom. We just have to instill that mindset, what if this happens? And we all know that when we see these things that happen on the news and those witnesses are interviewed, we constantly hear, I never thought this was going to happen. I never thought this would happen here. We can't have that mindset. Let's continue to play that game of what if every single day. What if this happens? We hope it never does, but because we played this game over and over again, if in fact it ever does happen, we're going to be just better prepared for that. Uh, sure, and uh, Lieutenant Pat Hurtado couldn't be here today, so I'm Lieutenant Dave Klug. I don't want to take his credit. He's now Commander Pat Hurtado. He just promoted, which is why I am here with you. Um, but I do have a lot of experience in this area, and uh, Officer Gramer's uh, dead on with um, understanding um, your role as really the, the first responder. Um, to a critical event that happens on your campus. Um, you know, you're ultimately responsible for that time when that incident starts to when law enforcement arrives. And again, we're talking about targeted violence here. We're not necessarily talking about just a disruptive student. Um, but that's ultimately your window of opportunity, which is, any guesses how long it's gonna take to have a police officer respond in the event if you called 911 about an active shooter? Very quickly, you're lucky, <laughs> very quickly. It, it definitely, I think I heard three to five minutes, definitely with, and even if it was not your local on, on site law enforcement, but if, you're, um, if we're coming to assist, it would definitely be within three to five minutes um, as far as what our response times are. And, and uh, that should be encouraging because understand from a campus wide perspective, if you hear gunshots and you're able to get to a lockable safe place or off campus, you're gonna be safe. Um, so again, having, having that mindset of what your own response, role and responsibility is. I'd also like to add that um, we're talking about like having a plan. Um, you, know, you may have heard run, hide, fight. You've probably watched a video or two or been trained here in some sort of response plan. Those are great. Um, but what we really like to do is prevent. Um, and what we know is that prevention is the key to this. There was a recent study done by the federal government that looked at a decade of school shootings and what they found in that 82% of those events, there was what they call leakage, which is information that was shared by the suspect, by the shooter, with a third party that shared of the, the plan. Um, and that is really our window of opportunity. And what systems do we have in place to take that information and intervene? And that goes back to the chief's conversation about threat assessment. We want to have that intervention. We want to stop the ideation from actualizing. Um, and that's all of our responsibility. And um, I'll also say that you should be reassured that we have great systems in place in the city of Irvine um, with uh, mental health resources, not only, I'm sure you have wellness coordinators here, but we have our own teams in place that can support 
in the event that we find someone who we have concerns about. And did, we, we didn't touch on uh, one part of this question yet, which is an uh, interesting question, never been asked it before, but basically what's ineffective? What are things that maybe you've been trained to do that we have found have not been effective? And I really had, we struggled to come up with anything great as an answer, but I'd like to bring up one interesting um, point that we've been talking about over the last year and a half, um, and this is post-Parkland, which is um, how if you're in some sort of lockdown status, you're, in a, you're able to be in a lockable space on campus, um, there's an announcement that there's some sort of lockdown or violent intruder, and the fire alarm goes off. And what do you do? Um, and so this has been a topic of conversation across the country. Um, and, and ultimately, what I'd like to uh, ask of you is that if you ever hear a fire alarm, whether there's a lockdown or not, assess. Assess before you leave your safe, secured location, or like what could be a safe, secured location, and bring yourself and students out into an open area. Um, I think there's three um, active shooter events that because of fire alarms act being activated, it resulted in people being injured by the, the suspect. So again, you don't want to violate your fire codes and, and laws, but um, I can tell you in Orange County, um, you're able to take a moment and assess, and if you hear something that's suspicious, see something suspicious, people are screaming, people are running, take a moment and pause before you, you go out. We, we have not had anyone uh, killed in a school fire in over 50 years. So I'm pretty confident to say you can take a minute to, uh, to assess. Thank you. Thank you very much, especially for answering both parts of the questions. Uh, we can only train our students to <laughs> do the same. Uh, back to uh, Chief Meyer, if we could. In the event, <clears throat> not only of an active shooter on campus, but really any dangerous sort of emergency. California, we have, we have lots of potential emergencies, earthquakes, fires, so forth. Uh, what is the realistic time frame between notifying campus police that something has gone wrong and the wider campus itself being notified? So this, uh, this question, uh, there's a lot of variables involved here and it, it deals with the time of day, the type of emergency we're dealing with, the location of the emergency, how many folks are on campus, what's going on on campus that day. So it's really difficult to pin down and, and uh, give you a definite time frame. And what this actually does is it points us right back to the situation where you're responsible to be prepared initially to any emergency and to have a plan. Uh, so let me do, let me add this. Uh, so we have, we have what we call Informacast. Uh, you're probably familiar with that. It's where our mechanism to uh, get audio messages out through landline phones in every classroom and through the blue emergency phones uh, th located throughout campus. Uh, we have canned messages where we have typed in what we want to say for certain situations. Most of them have been covered, I think. Uh, it would require our dispatcher to, to log into the system and to uh, send that message out and be careful that we're sending it out to our campus and not Saddleback or not both locations. but. Uh, typically, you know, it's going to take two to three minutes uh, to get something out immediately, and, that that's, and that's an optimistic time frame. So again, it points back to uh, have a plan for certain situations that may come up and know what you're going to do when you're faced with a, you know, an emergency. Uh, our regroup mass notification system, uh, depending upon who's sending that message out, maybe someone from... Uh, creative marketing uh, services team, or it could be the police department, that could actually take maybe longer. It could be three to five minutes uh, before the, you know, because the other component to this question is we want to make sure that the information we're putting out is timely, but it's also accurate. We, we certainly don't want to create a situation and, and make a situation worse by providing false information. So it has to be accurate uh, as well as timely, and those are the challenges that we're going to deal with when we put something out and it's going, there's going to be a few minute delay. Uh, but be mentally prepared, be situationally aware to every situation, you know, when, when you, whether you see a, uh, you know, a student come into your office or a classroom that just doesn't look quite right or you're anticipating a problem, just be keen and aware on that. I mean, it, it all goes back to, uh, you can, I can give an example where you're, you're in a parking lot uh, to go shopping and you know you're going to be in the store for a couple hours or at the mall and are you going to park next to a car uh, with four uh, individuals sitting in the car seemingly in the corner doing nothing are you going to park next to that car and then walk away and leave your car there probably not i would hope not uh, just because you should be thinking 
why are they there and should I leave my car there and with them knowing I'm probably going to be gone, no one's going to be watching the car for a while. Uh, you know, you don't do that. You don't leave you know, valuables in your car uh, in plain sight. You lock your car. Those are all steps you can take to make yourself a harder target. And it goes down to, to being prepared for that time delay, which could be two to three minutes or up to, up to five minutes through our regroup mass notification. So just have a plan and be prepared and always be thinking. Thank you. Uh, a little context for the next question. Sometimes we hear of, often after the fact, students who have uh, been trouble, if you would, at another campus, have been removed from that campus and then have found their way to IVC. So uh, this is for uh, Sergeant Brom. Uh, how is information gathered about students or groups who pose an immediate or a direct threat to the campus? And then how is this information shared among various agencies and even colleges in Orange County? Thank you. So if I take what you've just said, that <clears throat> this is a threat that's come from a, another campus, there are a number of ways that we share information in this county. Uh, first of all, we have a fusion center, which is part of a national fusion center network that shares information across the country. So we could certainly see threats in Charlottesville that could materialize uh, across the country uh, in this uh, state and in this county. So we are sharing that information on what types of things are happening uh, across college campuses or K-12 campuses across the nation. Uh, in our operational area in Orange County, we have working groups where we've connected all of our higher education uh, campuses and they're sharing information on potential threats. So if we have uh, a demonstration that's peaceful at first, but then turns into a little bit more aggressive or even violent, that information is shared uh, across those higher education campuses. Um, as far as an immediate or direct threat, those two things are not exactly the same. An immediate threat in the world of law enforcement means something is about to happen. So uh, the Irvine Valley College Police or whatever local jurisdiction would investigate that and then uh, charge that person with a crime and arrest them. A direct threat uh, is going to have to be investigated a little bit more long term. We'd go through our threat assessment process that the, the chief mentioned earlier and then we would uh, share that information with the local law enforcement and then up to the Fusion Center and if it is deemed necessary we'll share that across all of our campuses. Um, Really, it's the collaboration amongst law enforcement, amongst uh, multiple different groups, uh, educators, uh, administrators, private sector, where we are made aware of these potential threats, direct threats, or immediate threats, and then we share that information so we can be, come prepared for what could happen. And I want to just mention that what Officer Gramer said is spot on. You know. This question says, how is information gathered? Well, information is gathered um, amongst a number of ways. Uh, we have hotlines, tip lines, there's the FBI's National Threat Operations Center, but a key way that information can be gathered is by you folks, by the people that are, are interacting with these potential threateners on a daily basis, if not weekly basis, sharing that information with your police department letting them have this information, vet it out, and, and go through an investigative process to then find out what's really going on. And that's not just Irvine Valley College Police, but that's Irvine Police. Throughout Orange County, every law enforcement agency has a way that you can communicate this information with them and share this information and then let us do uh, our uh, process of either a threat assessment investigation and find out where we can go from there. Um, and, and then that information is shared throughout the United States. It's not just shared locally, but through our connectivity with the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, Secret Service, other uh, California agencies. We share that information so everyone is aware of what's going on and we can take steps to prepare for that. Um, and so that's nationwide. And that's the great thing about the, the Fusion Center Network. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, uh, the campaign, see something, say something, and that's everyone. And that's not just here at your college campus, it's where you shop, it's around your 
personal residence. Uh, sharing that information, if you see something that makes you pause and say, should I say something about that? The answer is yes. And there's plenty of ways that you can share that information with law enforcement and we can start to, to begin an investigation or vet that information out. Thank you. Uh, a bit of a follow-up, I guess, on, on this last question, or at least a, a connection. Uh, this is for our uh, district council, uh, Pilar Marin. Uh, under what circumstances may warnings and even photos of threatening persons be distributed on campus? And how widely may that information be disseminated on campus? Good morning, everyone. Um, as the um, police chief noted earlier, we have um, clearly timely warnings that are issued whenever there is an imminent threat. Um, I do want to also discuss on balance uh, some of the, the rights to privacy that individuals have on campus. Um, students, even when they have gone through a, um, a hearing and have been disciplined, are protected by FERPA, um, and unless they provide consent, or if there's a, a situation where there's an exception, such as when there's an imminent threat to um, someone being harmed, um, then information about them can be released. Um, similarly, uh, for example, I just wanted to mention this. Um, we, uh, on campus, uh, uh, have student, the campus is open to anybody, and um, employees, excuse me, students who come to campus and register here, and, and maybe, for example, sex offenders, have to register with the police department, and that information is available um, to those on campus who wish to have it. However, before that uh, information can be accessed, there is an agreement that, that's, that those individuals that want to access that information have to comply with about how that information is used. Um, and, and that in part is besides the FERPA rights that students have, in California we have a constitutional right to privacy. And so the institution is limited in the information that it can release about individuals. Um, generally information is released on a need to know basis. So if we have um, information, for example, we have a workplace violence policy here on campus, administrative regulation, uh, 400.3, uh, which indicates how employees are going to be informed um, of, of certain uh, situations where uh, there's, there's a threat. Um, but we have to balance that against the um, a constitutional right to privacy in California. And we also have statutory um, rights to privacy um, in California. So again, only those with a need to know are provided with that information. Um, so with regard to when um, photographs or, or other information is distributed, that's going to depend on the specific circumstances. There are situations where that information is available um, and there is an immediate threat and um, in conjunction with the police department and administrators, um, that information will be provided to the individuals that have a, a need for that information. Thank you. You'll notice the panel now is relaxing because they believe they have just answered the last question. They are, however, incorrect. So I'm going to go off script for just a moment. And, I'd, and uh, if you feel that you have a response to this, please let me know. Given your area of expertise and what you've heard this morning, uh, what is one thing, in your opinion, that we as uh, administration, management, staff, faculty can do to make our environment on campus more safe and more productive for education. So I'd like to interject here uh, because I want to share some of my experiences with you regarding that question. And uh, we'll typically be brought into a situation, uh, my staff, uh, regarding uh, a student who's maybe committed a crime or uh, is it, you know, 
acting in a very suspicious manner or is just presenting significant challenges. And uh, we are brought into the situation typically third or fourth or fifth down the line. And it always amazes me how people will share uh, with a colleague or they'll share with a, even a dean or uh, a member of the administration or a peer uh, or a family member and say, what do you think? What do you think about this? This is kind of weird. And, and then finally someone will say, well, did you call the police? And usually the answer is, oh, no. And then they'll call us and then we get brought in. And I just can't stress enough, and I know, um, I'm sure that my uh, fellow panel members in law enforcement can agree, uh, it's, it's so important for us to hear and to know about these situations as quickly as possible uh, and early as possible to preserve uh, any type of investigation that we would have to follow and for us to, to be knowledgeable about it, not, and not only for the investigation, but to mitigate any p potential crimes that may occur after the fact. Uh, so. Uh, you know, we keep saying, you know, see something, say something, but call our department. You know, it can be anonymously, but <clears throat> I have to say, excuse me, uh, probably 90% of the calls that we get uh, about situations that are un unusual or whatever amount to nothing, and that's okay. That's why we're here. That's why officers patrol. That's why they answer calls for service. It's those few percent that, that do amount to something that can make the difference between someone getting hurt, someone having property stolen, some some other crime occurring uh, that could have been prevented uh, or otherwise mitigated through our knowledge and through our advanced notification. So I just can't stress enough, call the police. It's, it's completely fine if what you're telling us amounts to nothing. We're not gonna think poorly of you. Um, <clears throat> we're not gonna laugh at you uh, or anything like that. It just needs, we just need to know um, and confer with us as, as you would feel comfortable conferring with you know, someone that you do trust. We hope that we have that, that trust uh, with you. So I think that's very important. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of those tonight, or today talking about targeted violence, I just want to remind all of you first and foremost that it's a very, very unlikely event. Um, you work or live and work in a very safe area. Um, we, we'd be better off talking about uh, the dangers of texting and driving to save lives than talking about this, in all honesty. Um, but it's a possibility, and so we have an obligation to be experts on it, train on it, and work with the community on this topic. So um, with that in mind, um, I would, if, as far as making your environment a little bit safer, again, very unlikely event that you're ever going to be in a situation where you're faced with this type of targeted violence. Um, but do a little research on your own. There is some fantastic open source, meaning like YouTube videos on things like how to barricade your classroom. Um, we talk about in our trainings that a lockable safe is a safer space. Um, it's, it's not uncommon on college campuses that the doors are not locked, but it doesn't mean you can't secure them and lock them, barricade them, and prevent access. Because we're only talking about a few minutes that you have to protect yourself until law enforcement arrives. Um, when law enforcement gets there, these problems are, are usually over or immediately over at that point. So that's the short window. And if you're, you, know, you and your students and most of your students are going to be able to assist you in this, unlike when we train a, a classroom full of uh, kindergartners, um, you have support to be able to put every desk and table in front of a doorway. It's, it's very difficult to get in and cause harm to you and your students if you've done some of those things. Um, how can you uh, shimmer secure your door? Um, a, a classic example was in Virginia Tech, um, you know, again, a college campus where in that hall, none of the doors, interior doors locked. Um, and there was one classroom on, on the second floor um, that no one was shot or injured in. And that was a classroom full of engineering students who had figured out how to secure their door and the suspect couldn't make entry. So um, if I have one thing to share, one, a lockable safe is a safer space, so know where you have lockable spaces nearby, whether in your, your classroom or just in life, be paying attention to that, your avenues of escape, and uh, don't be afraid to uh, do a little research on barricading and securing your classroom. Thank you. Just make a, one more comment that's not directly related to your question, but I just wanted to say it. And just mention, um, if it's not apparent, of the outstanding working relationship and partnership that the Irvine Police Department has with the Irvine Valley College Police Department. Uh, Chief Meyer and I, uh, we know each other, we're colleagues. Uh, there is a mutual respect there and confidence and trust between the two departments. And make no mistake, he and his department, his officers, have um, every capability uh, to, to respond to and uh, and address any kind of incident that occurs on campus. 
uh, but but he also knows that that we are uh, ready and available uh, to back up his his uh, officers if needed. And beyond that, their officers also on their own police radios have um, our police radio frequency program programmed into their radios, so they can call us and communicate with Irvine PD direct should the need arise. Yes, um, I wanted to mention something. You've been hearing us speak about Cleary um, quite a bit, and um, Cleary was um, is, is a law that, that came into effect because a college student was killed and raped um, in her dorm, and her parents, um, one of the arguments they made is had we known the incidence of crime on this campus, we would have made different choices. And so the Cleary Law, what, what it provides is a report that is published by all colleges and universities, um, in, including this district, by every October 1st. And it is posted. And um, the purpose of the report is to provide information to students in the campus community about what crimes are actually taking place on campus and where they take place so that individuals can make decisions. So for example, you might find that in a specific parking lot or a specific place uh, tends to be um, more vulnerable to certain crimes. Um, another very um, great tool that came about um, in correlation with these Cleary reports that are filed is that you can go online and make a comparison between this college and other colleges and you will see that Irvine Valley College and, and the district in general is very safe. So you can take um, whatever college or university um, and then I think it allows you to make a comparison of up, up to four different colleges. Um, so if you type up Cleary and comparison, I think it'll, it'll pull up the government webpage and you can type in the name of the college and then whatever colleges you want to compare it to and it'll give you a breakdown of the types of crimes that take place on these different campuses and how it compares um, to this campus. Thank you. Um, in terms of um, hate crime and hate incidents, unfortunately, these topics uh, have no boundary, right? The impact have, for example, you know, it doesn't matter your race or ethnicity or socioeconomic, uh, at least in Orange County that I have experienced that hate crime and hate uh, incident have impacted all um, if we um, respond to them. But in order to create a safer um, environment in terms of inclusion and value diversity, um, you have to take into account of we all have to be on the same page. You have to live it and practice it. Most importantly, the student have to feel it. So if the student come to your classroom or on your campus, they have to feel that this is a safe and inclusive campus. They have to feel that this is a place where I can grow and learn. So it's, you have to set that tone for the environment to be safe. So whatever it takes, uh, working together to create that uh, would be the best practice. Thank you. Uh, in just a couple of minutes, not now, but in just a couple of minutes, we're going to take a break. Uh, there will be refreshments out in the lobby. Uh, I'm hoping that members of our panel will have time to stick around and perhaps uh, engage in some one-on-one -on -one conversation, perhaps answer some questions uh, that you now realize you should have asked. Uh, our second panel uh, will be focusing again on specific procedures at Irvine Valley College. Uh, I would ask that as you exit the auditorium, if you haven't already, that you please pick up the handouts on the table. They'll be useful to you in your second, end, uh, pardon me, in the second panel today. I'd certainly like to thank our panel. Uh, you have taken uh, significant time out of very busy schedules to be with us today. We really appreciate having you all here and having the perspectives that you offered. And if we would, uh, please thank our panel. Thank you.